um, I'm going to talk about uh, patterns of flint raw material procurement in the late Neolithic through early Bronze Age at a site that I will henceforth call Tsipori. Um, and I work on this with Aviad Agam and various other people, including Avi Gopher at uh, Tel Aviv University. I usually work on lower and middle Paleolithic things, but uh, rocks are use interesting at all times. So. <laughs> So many of you know this. Why would we look at raw materials? Well, because they are uh, indicators of how people lived in the past. They are, uh, we can look at the different types of rocks and see whether there were specific strategies for selecting uh, the suitable resources. We can look at the different uh, sources that the rocks came from to understand something about how people were using the land, the landscape. All of which I'm used to in the Paleolithic, but in the Neolithic specifically, uh, I guess it was a time of great change in how people were living, and we should expect that to show up in uh, the resources that they were using, including lithics. And so uh, one aspect of it was that there, if they were more sedentary, they would be more attached to a particular territory, and territories have flint sources, so we wanted to see whether we would find that. Sipori is located in Israel near the Sea of Galilee, in fact very near to Nazareth, which oddly does not picture on this uh, map, but there's Sipori and Nav Nazareth is right about there. And uh, it is a salvage operation, you see the site up there, this picture's the same picture. It was a salvage operation uh, conducted by other people, not us, from 2011 to 2013. Uh, as they were expanding the road. It spread all the way across this, this area. A whole lot of material was found, of most of which I know nothing about. Uh, I'm not the person to explain the site to you. But um, at least three phases were, were identified. Pre-pottery Neolithic, which we we'll call PPN. The Wadi Raba, uh, which is late pottery Neolithic, which we we'll call either WR or Wadi Raba from now on, and EB, the early bronze, plus various other things. There's a Roman site nearby. There are all sorts of other bits and pieces lying around. And uh, there was an ads making workshop that Avi had published a paper about, uh, which is marked by the red arrow, because I stole this picture from this paper, actually. So that's, that's why the red arrow is there. So we studied everything that we could find from the PPN, because I always like the old stuff best. If that's the oldest I can get, that's what I'll get. So everything we had of that, plus only a sample from the Wadi Raba, and only a sample from the EB. And in both cases, we tried to get pieces that would represent the, the proportions of things like flakes and tools and uh, cores and rubbish. We, we resisted looking at chips, uh, but we looked at all the other stuff in approximately the correct proportions. Plus there were special pieces that we didn't include in that, that general assemblage general sample. We had uh, arrowheads, um, canonite blades, fan scrapers, bifacial knives, sickle blades, various things like this which we treated in their particular typological categories and sampled or looked at either as many of them as we could find or at least a sample of a hundred to a few hundred depending on how many there were of them. They are not included in the general sample seems all too complicated. Uh, methods, very basic stuff. We looked at them, uh, made visu visual identifications based on the usual uh, suspects of color, cortex, homogeneity, did we see any fossils, uh, that sort of thing. I'm a splitter, so I make a new type every time something looks a little bit different, so we ended up with 42 types, many of which I was perfectly aware would be variants of each other. Um, and then we named them A to AQ, following alphabetical order and going around and around. Then we went out in the field a few times and found flint sources that we uh, collected samples at to compare to the uh, archaeological pieces. Went back to the lab, compared the visible characteristics. We made a few thin sections, 22, I believe, 22, um, some of which were archaeological samples, some of which were geological samples. And one of them was really interesting, so I, I got somebody to look at it through a scanning electron microscope just for fun. 
This is the geologic map of the area. Sikori is marked with the big blue star. The red marks are uh, potential Eocene flint sources. Almost all of the bedrock in the area is Eocene. There is this one non-Eocene source up here, and the, it's a companion uh, flint source, a Mishash formation. It's very famous in Israel for producing nice flint. So I saw it on the map and said, we have to go find that. Um, and the source is so small, the outcrop of companion rock is so small that it is completely hidden by that pink spot. It's, it's under there. But we did actually find it. Um, these are all quite close by to the site, and we didn't look any further afield. Uh, what did we find out? We found that uh, the local sources, and by local, I'm, I mean within two and a half kilometers or so, so really local, uh, they included lots and lots of flint. This is one we called Olive Grove for some reason. <laughs> uh, and many of these rocks that you see are flint nodules, and they're just lying there, and they're all over the place, and they're big. Um, they, the microscope, microscopic work showed that they were pretty basic, uh, normal uh, marine flint with forearms and sponge spicules and the normal textures. They look like flint. They act like flint. They are flint. Um, and they matched 16 of my hyper-divided types, including the fact that some of those types may have been heat treated, so we, we made accommodations for that. Here are some of them. Type A, of which you will hear more, Odd was the first one we found, uh, and that's not odd at all, all, as you will see. Type A, type B, there is a difference, seriously. Uh, type C, which is a bit darker, type D, which is even darker, type F, which has stripes. We actually found nodules that had two or three or four of these types within the same nodule, so they're the same thing. Then we had a uh, source at Bir el Maksur which is also Eocene, about seven and a half kilometers away. And it had, uh, under the microscope, it had this very distinctive texture. It's got this dark matrix, um, which is dark in plain polarized and cross polarized light. Uh, and then just crammed full of fossils. So, and it matches type AD. Type AD from the uh, uh, artifact assemblage is this one, and it looks like that one. Another one looks like like uh, anything else that I had ever seen before. I've since been finding more like that. But. So that was that was a lot of fun. And that was the one that I sent up to Fredericton to get some SEM work done. I didn't have time to do it myself. But. Dark muddy matrix, planktonic forams, and uh, possibly reducing environment because there's a lot of metals. There's a lot of these have about 1% vanadium, which is pretty high for a flint. So something that may be of some use at some point, but haven't done anything with it beyond saying that. That Campanian source, which we did find, had a lot of very dark flint, um, huge nodules. Um, was it the source of the types, the dark types in the assemblage? I don't know. The thin sections are completely banal. It's dark flint, and so are they. And then we have 13 types left over that we don't know the source of. And I'll only mention these ones. Two of them are really fun because they have nummelites. Nummelites, if you know forams, they're big. You can see them with the naked eye. It's very exciting. I jump up and down and get excited. In fact, I even blew it up so you could see. See? It's a little bit fuzzy there, but you can see them. They're actual visible fossils. And they're definitely Eocene. Okay, so all the rocks around there are Eocene. Maybe that's not so exciting. We didn't find any nummelites in any of the rocks that we tested from there, and we didn't see them, except for Bir el Naksur, there's one or two. So they're scarce in there. But otherwise, somewhere out there, there is a source of Eocene flint with lots of nummelites in it. And this is actually starting to be a problem at Kesem, too, because at Kesem Cave, farther south, where we work on interesting uh, older stuff, um, we're finding nummelites, and we don't know where they come from. So anybody knows sources of nummelites in Israel? Please tell me. Oh, one of those tables. 
Um, yeah, the main raw materials. How much did they use? Well, let's start with type A. We got kind of tired of seeing type A. You consider that we looked at about 4,000 pieces of it. They used a lot of it. In fact, they used the local types and type G. First seven types that we encountered in the assemblage were used an awful lot. In the PPN, 90% are accounted for by them. G is in blue because it's a non-local source or type. And I don't know what the source of it is. But the other six are definitely local and they make up roughly 90%. And in the PPN, the other, the rest, these are all zeros. So the rest is this uh, unidentifiable pieces. They're, they're too weathered or altered to uh, figure out where they come from. So that's kind of boring. <coughs> Wadi Raba, 98% are local in the main types. That's really boring. But they're very consistent. Now mind you, remember this is the general assemblage. And in the um, EB, we go back down to 90% with those main types. And finally, something noticeable about other types. Uh, they don't have so much unidentifiable material in this assemblage, so K and O and others are non-local. The others are just variants of local. But there is at least a little bit in that assemblage which we could have fun, some fun with. Then in the special tool samples, we did quite a few categories of them, but I'll just present these four. These four. The arrowheads had uh, quite low type A. Uh, don't look at the next line. Let's just look at the arrowheads now. Um, pretty common local material, but they did have these unknown types that were quite common. So arrowheads, of course, are a very specialized tool. You need something that you can make a small, sharp thing out of, so perhaps they had preferences. Bifacial knives, only 19% type A. This was practically exciting for us because they used other things. But what they used was actually local. They used a lot of local material, but they chose, excepting G, which is not local, they chose the dark varieties. They actually, for some reason, selected darker types preferentially to make their bifacial knives out of, even though it was still local flint. And it was coming from the same nodules as, as the lighter stuff, so, for whatever reason. Candlelight blades, 5% um, and 3% don't look like big numbers, but in this context, they used these types in a noticeable proportion. And the EB, they had 25 different raw material types in their candlelight blades which is really diverse. And then finally, the sickle blades, they like type AE, especially in the EB, 15%. So what's special about AE and AD? They are coarse grained. They're kind of bumpy. They've got sort of granular surfaces. So maybe those are better types for making a sickle blade out of. They acted differently. To sum up, I haven't even had any papers flashed at me yet. Oh, there's one. <laughs> um, to sum up, they used a lot of type A. I could stand here all day telling you that. Type A, local raw material, they did have a strong attachment to that territory. And they were probably not very stupid. They needed to make tools and they had the raw material right there, so why go anywhere else? Uh, but type AD came from seven and a half kilometers away and was used for 5% uh, or so of canonite blades. So there was a specific need for that one and they went and got it. They made other selections depending on grain size or color in a few cases. So they were uh, part of a larger world even though they were at this greater territor territoriality. And that's it for me, except I suppose since I have extra time, I can tell you. This is a picture of the watermelon butchery site. <laughs> <laughs> the hammer is only for scale. All, all work was done with an actual stone tool, which is sitting there in the carcass of the slaughtered watermelon, who was consumed by the participants uh, after this. Any questions?